multilingual instructional coordinator. Oh, that's great. We're also streaming this to YouTube. So if anybody out there, if you somehow disconnected, you're always welcome to find the Sidelets Education YouTube channel on live. And this will be recorded. So you'll be able to watch it again in replay on YouTube. Maria from Nacogdoches. We put Nacogdoches in the Houston column. You're welcome, Maria. Hamilton. See, this is what happens. If you don't type to panelist attendees, only we get this fantastic information. We are officially live. Good morning, Pam Broussard. <laughs> Hi. Katie, Texas. Morning, Pam. Good morning. All right, everyone. We'll give just one more minute to have people sign in. Um, if you're joining us right now, go ahead and type into the chat your name, your role, multilingual outreach worker. That's a fantastic title. Make sure we're typing to panelists and attendees. Oh, great, we're up to 92, that's fantastic. Everybody is muted. All of our participants are muted. So you're only going to be hearing and seeing the panelists. No problem. No problem at all. Okay. Good, good, good. Thank you guys for writing in. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Good morning. My name is Anna Mattis. I'm the product development manager and a senior consultant for world languages for science education. And it is such an honor to be able to be here with you today and hosting this conference on such a a pivotal and emotional and a very real and important topic that is so much at the heart of our minds as educators right now at this moment in this country. Um, you're here at Amplifying the Voices of Unaccompanied Minors. You're going to be hearing from several individuals that have taken harrowing journeys to get to this country, as well as have now continued their work in an educational realm so that they can educate others about the experience and hopefully lead to some advocacy and empathy for our students, um, adults, children, anybody going through the same exact situation at this time. And we're going to be giving you plenty of opportunities to be able to donate to the cause and, and help. And John Seidlitz, our, our founder of Seidlitz Education is going to give some really amazing uh, numbers on what your donation can mean if you do choose to donate today, okay? This is what our day is going to look like. We're gonna have some brief welcome and introductions. You're going to be hearing from Emily Francis as well as a student of hers, uh, Jorge Juarez, then Dr. Jose Luis Zelaya, as well as finishing the day with Ari Hornarvar. Now, when we get to each of those individuals, you're going to get a more uh, thorough, detailed introduction of who exactly they are. So I'm not gonna steal that thunder away. And while this is a rough outline of what our schedule is going to look like, please know that there's going to be about a 10 minute break in between sessions. So you're gonna have an opportunity to stop, to, to get some coffee, to stretch and come back and join us while we transition between speakers, okay? This session is going to be recorded. I mentioned that when we began earlier, if you're now joining us, um, it will, it's live to YouTube right now, but then later on, you'll be able to receive the recording if you signed up to register and it will be housed on our Sidelets Education YouTube channel. So you'll always be able to go back to it and see the sessions again. Um, we ask that if you have questions or comments or you're, you're commenting along during the presentations, please write to all panelists and attendees. Go to that drop down box and make sure that your comments are not just to panelists. While we love getting it, if it's something that you want everybody to see, be sure that you have all panelists and attendees selected. At the end of the day, you will be getting a uh, certificate. So for those of us that are teachers that need to have proof for their districts, their administrators or whatnot, that you're attending the session today, we do have a certificate digitally that we'll be able to send you. And then lastly, I just wanted to make a quick plug to Sidelist Education. We're hosting today along with Inlier. If you've never heard of us before, we are a company whose mission statement is to develop language in every we have opportunities for ESL teachers, bilingual teachers, foreign language teachers, 
throughout the breaks, you're going to see these slides rotating around. So you'll get this information a little bit further, but we have some sessions coming up for the remainder of the summer before school starts that are either online conferences or professional development opportunities for teachers. And you can just hover your phone over that QR code and find some more information about that as well go to our website under upcoming events. So I think that is all that I have to share before we get started. I'm going to turn it over to Orly Clapholtz, who is an amazing mother, educator of English learners, and is also the co-founder of InLiar Learning. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Anna. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm Orly Klappholtz. Uh, like Anna said, I'm the co-founder of InLiar Learning. And for those who don't know, we are a technology forward company uh, creating education so educational solutions for multilingual students. Uh, you'll find more information uh, on this slide, which will rotate uh, throughout the break as well. And you can use the QR code or visit our website to learn more. Uh, I was really honored and excited when John reached out about hosting this conference with him. It is always a pleasure to partner with Silas Education uh, and their amazing team. Uh, throughout my experience as an educator, I've had the privilege to teach many unaccompanied minors, and they've always taught me so much about perseverance, strength, and kindness. And so it's, I really am so excited to hear from our speakers today and to be a part of this conference. I'm now going to turn it over to John Seidlitz, who is the founder of Seidlitz Education, who will tell you more uh, about the fundraiser that we have going on. Well, good morning, everybody. I just, I thank you, Anna, and, and thank you, Orly. And especially, I'd like to thank uh, Emily and uh, Dr. Zelaya and uh, Ari for uh, speaking for us today and for uh, Courtney who's gonna be speaking with us also, one of Emily's students who's gonna uh, share with us this morning as well. Um, I, I'm just amazed that that this has, has come together when Orly and I started talking about it, you always feel like you wanna be helpful in the, in the maximum way possible. And I know that we have so many educators with us today of so many different kinds and we're helping in the classroom, we're doing a lot of things, but I wanted to tell you briefly about an organization that we're supporting today, in lieu of having a registration for this conference being paid, we are asking, if you can, all of our participants, if you have an opportunity to donate to KIND, which is an organization called Kids in Need of Defense. Now, if you're like me, you wanna give smart and not just from the heart, but also from the head. So I wanted to let you know that, it, uh, that they have a 100% uh, uh, rating on Charity Navigator's assessment of finance and accountability. So if you Google Charity Navigator and you type in kind, your money is actually going towards what they do, which is pro bono representation, which means representation for unaccompanied minors. Now, just an, uh, I'd like to watch just a brief video, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about kind, and then we're going to jump in and to our first speaker. So let me do that right now. Kinder Transport was an organized rescue effort that brought 10,000 refugee children to Great Britain from Nazi occupation. Many of the children were taken in by compassionate foster families throughout Great Britain. These families opened their hearts and homes to the children of complete strangers and provided safety where they could thrive. Today, thousands of children are similarly in need. In 2016, there were an estimated 95,000 unaccompanied child refugees in Europe. As in Europe, the United States is facing fundamental questions about how to respond to large numbers of refugees fleeing grave violence and persecution, many of them children. It is a huge humanitarian crisis on the border Small right now. Small children crossing into the U.S. in many cases alone without their parents. They're from Central America and are often fleeing violent crime. Over 200,000 unaccompanied children have arrived in the United States since 2014. Most come from Honduras, El Salvador and Guatemala, three of the most dangerous countries in the world. They are fleeing violence from which their countries cannot protect them. I want all my family here because in my country it's really danger this moment. The 
United States is a beacon of hope for these children who leave their homes and families behind in a search for a future free from fear. Yet rather than a compassionate reception, they are placed in deportation proceedings and face an increasingly hostile immigration system. The choice seems clear. We need to step up and help these young refugees as the United Kingdom did for the kinder transport children. Now my life has changed. I go to school and I see my future in a different way. Sometimes living our country is not easy, but you have to achieve the new opportunity that life gives you. You can make a huge difference. You can change the, the outcome of somebody's life. Maybe we are a little different. We have a different language, but we are the same. And so, uh, what? In a changing moment. Oh, wait a minute, I, mean, I, gotta, I gotta stop the other. That's all I decided to name this way because at the same time, I changed my life environment. I Sorry. met with my mom again after. Okay, there we go. Uh, so one second, let me get back. Okay. So I, I wanted to also share with you that, that they share this in the, in the video, but you might not have heard that unaccompanied children with attorneys are five times more likely to gain U.S. protection, while only one in 10 of unaccompanied children without attorneys are able to win their cases. It costs approximately, it depends on how complicated the case is, but about $1,500 to protect one child from deportation. And on the KIND website, they say that every $1 donated becomes $7 worth of pro bono representation. And Silence Education right now, we are matching Every donation that's made from two days ago all the way up until Friday, we're matching the donation. In, and in other words, what we're trying to do is meet a $5,000 goal, which could protect from deportation. We have about four, so we have four speakers, exactly four speakers who are going to be speaking today. And I, I, I think that we can meet that $5,000 goal. I'm, I'm really hoping that we're able to do that. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, before we jump in, and I introduce Emma, uh, people who've donated, Rhonda McKilvia Hughes, Ron Wynn, Elizabeth Skelton, Margaret Valentine Mannion, Nat Natalia Heckman, uh, Katie Topple, Jenny Vo, Valentina Gonzalez, Shilpa Palawat, Mich uh, Sherry Liptak, Angel Angelica Mitchell, Virginia Lowe, uh, Anna Mattis, Margaret Valentine, Carol Salva, uh, Janet Hyatt, and Alma Seidlitz. So I'd like to thank all of those of you who've already donated, and we look forward to uh, meeting our goal and helping KIND in its mission to protect kids like the speakers who we're going to hear from today. And so we will, uh, uh, oh, we've had asked some folks to ask for a link to the video, and so we'll try to provide that in the, in the chat in a little bit. Uh, um, so let me go ahead then and introduce our first speaker. And have I forgotten anything? Did I leave anything out? Are we ready to introduce Emily? Okay. So let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Emily Francis. My experience with Emily came from being in uh, Carol Salva's classroom, is where I first heard of Emily Francis. But before I say anything about her, let me just ask this, and I'm looking at the chat right now. How many of you who have already either seen or heard from Emily Francis before, just type in there, I know Emily, or I've heard Emily, just type into the chat if you've heard or seen Emily Francis uh, speak before. So a lot of you have heard her speak. Excellent. So some of you follow her on Twitter, some of you haven't met her before. Okay, so those of you who haven't, you're in for a treat. Uh, I first uh, met Emily at a TESOL conference, but I first heard about her when I was in another teacher's classroom, Carol Salva, who taught uh, students with interrupted formal education. And I was in the classroom and, and she was having the students read her blog. Anna, you were with, you were with me in that classroom. I remember that now. Yeah, we were in, in Houston observing uh, Emily Francis. I'm sorry, we were observing Carol Salva and they were reading the blog. The kids were so touched. These were all, most of Carol's kids were refugee, asylee or other students with uh, interrupted formal education. And they were so touched by uh, Emily's words and her videos and what she was sharing that they wanted to share back with her. And they had this kind of dialogue going back and forth. Then I found out she was dialoguing with kids in classrooms all over the place in Canada, everywhere. But she really, uh, is someone that I, I don't want to say too much about uh, her story because she's going to share a lot of that with you. But 
I, if you haven't heard before, you're in for a treat. If you've heard her before, uh, strap in your seatbelts. This is going to be an amazing talk. And I'm also very pleased that uh, she has a guest who she's going to be sharing with us uh, his talk to, who's a current student of hers, which is really exciting. And thank you, Emily, for uh, having him as well. So without further ado, I think we're ready to hand the baton over to my, my good friend and colleague, uh, Emily Francis. Hello, thank you so much for such a great introduction. This is like so exciting. Like I woke up this morning, I'm nervous more so than I've ever been before. I am thrilled. This is so dear to my heart. You know, when you are talking about amplifying newcomers voices, those voices that for so long have been silenced for so many reasons. But here is an opportunity for us to come together and build up a platform for students' voices to be heard. And then I'm so excited, just so many here are uh, taking time from their summers off to join us, so thank you. And then again, if we can contribute, and I have not, and I, I'm making it my goal, I will contribute to this um, uh, cause. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And again, of course, like I saw the comments here, many of you have heard my story. So if you heard it, well, you're in for a treat again, you will hear it again, but hopefully you'll get some new insights because today I do wanna to talk to you about creating those meaningful spaces for newcomers hidden potential. And when I get to that point, you'll see what I'm talking about is hidden potentials in our students. Again, thank you for having me and thank you for this opportunity today. I wanna to start by sharing my immigrant story, I used to call it, my immigrant story, but I changed it from story to journey. And I was reading a book in Comunidad and I switched my mind shift from telling a story because a story can be forgotten, a story can be left behind, a story can be erased. But a journey, a journey, those are experiences that continuously shape and they influence our identity. And this is exactly what happened to me and our students who travel through different borders to get to the United States. Those are experiences that come together like a puzzle and it becomes their greatest gift. That's mine. It hasn't been very long that I started to embrace and appreciate my journey as I see it today. And you know why? Well, first of all, because like Tara Martin says, it takes a lot of courage to expose those um, identities, part of our identities that are hard to tell. Those experiences that we go through while we get here can cause some stirring in our heart, but it gets a point when that story and those experiences are validated, that's when we take the courage to tell our story. And just a few years ago, I wanna say 2017, was when I started getting the courage to tell my story because someone told me your story matters. Your story needs to be heard. And when I started hearing that my story needed to be heard, that's when I started gaining the courage to share it. I am from Guatemala and have you, you just heard it on the video. It's one of the most terrible countries in Central America together with El Salvador and Honduras. And, but that's it, that's where I was born and that's where I lived for 15 years with my mother, a single mother of five children. I'm right here, the oldest, the, tall, the tallest, <laughs> where my mom is taller, but the tallest of all for five of us. And of course, my gift was to help my mother as the oldest of all. My gift was to cook in the house, to help my mother, to change diapers, to take care of the grocery shopping, to uh, fetch water from the factory to home because we didn't have running water and making sure that the kids were taken care of. 
just like you see in this picture. Here it is, one of my littlest sister eating some frijoles that I had prepared. So at a very early age, I learned what it is to take care of others, especially my siblings. So making sure that they had the food that they needed to have. Of course, while my mother was working, traveling to the coast, hours and hours to bring oranges for us to sell in the market. My job was to make sure that the kids were being fed, that they were being taken care of, that they were um, safe, because <laughs> I needed to make sure they weren't breaking any bones while mama was gone. But I loved, I loved this gift that I had as an, the oldest sister to be able to take care of the siblings. Another job that I had if I was not at home with my siblings was at a very early age, nine, 10 years old, I already had a business running on the my build. And I said a business because while my mother was at home with the kids, it was my turn to be at the market with my own basket of oranges. So a nine, 10 years old, I was already making business, making sure I get the biggest buck for my oranges that I was selling. So it was a uh, strategy that we learned from a very, very early age to be able to survive, to be able to make sure that we have what we need, at least food on our table, since the shelter that we had wasn't even our own. We lived in many different places just to make sure that we were paying the least that we could pay so our money could last as much as it could. So uh, if I, yeah, a school, of course, I attended school. If I was not here taking care of the little ones, then I was a school. One of the schools I do remember the most was a two hour away that I had to walk to and from. But um, I, it was just, we had to make it do. And I was just telling my mother the other day how some of the things that we used to see on the way, and I say we, because it was me and my younger sister, Leslie, who used to do that journey with me to that school and us holding hands, just traveling those two hours to make it to school. And I tell you this because all these experiences that I had at home, selling my oranges at the business or knocking from door to door and traveling two hours to school and um, learning and making sure that I was learning how to read and how to write, all of those are experiences that shape who I am today. Those experiences that help me to be persistent, those experiences that help me to be um, strong in what I believe and what I love, I embraced Guatemalan culture, Guatemalan food. I cooked everything from, well, chicken bones because we really couldn't afford, afford uh, bigger pieces of chicken. So chicken legs and chicken feet and gizzards and well, you name it, the cheapest part that I could find to cook. But all of those experiences shape my journey because at the age of 13, my mother made the hardest decision that a mother, and I say a mother because I am a mother, and I cannot imagine making this decision of traveling to a country miles and miles away and leaving the children behind. But just knowing that that transition was going to be for the best. Her idea was going to, uh, coming to the United States, making some money and sending the money back so we can have more food, shelter over our head and maybe new clothing. If you look at this picture right here is new outfits that we were able to afford. But for two years, my mother was separated from us. And as a teacher, I learned that this family separation is supposed to cause in the mind and in the heart the same sensation as you go through when you are uh, suffer from family loss. And I didn't think that back then. All I can think of is, oh, my mother is gone. She's working. And here am I trying to take care of the kids. It was something that I was used to doing anyway. We built this shack in a neighbor's backyard and we were able to have at least shelter over our head. 
And being away from her was very difficult until that November 1993, when we asked her for her to return to Guatemala because we needed her. My little sibling, my brother was starting to call me mom. I was becoming mom already at the age of 15 and he needed mom to be there, not a sister to be mom. I did the best that I could, but not what a mother should be doing in that moment. But instead of my mother going back to Guatemala, like she, we, we had already planned, she sent a smuggler to pick me up. So here am I at the age of 15 years old, being told to pack up my essentials. And when you are told to pack up your essentials and you look around your shack or your, your room, you run to pack it all. You want to bring everything in there, but you know you can't. So you look around and think, what can I bring with me that I know I want to have and hold with me? So for me, it was letters that I have written to mom that she has written to me. It has gone back and forth. I had that in my backpack. I have these pictures that you see here. I wouldn't have these pictures to show you if I would have packed that as an essential for me. Because to me, my experiences that I have lived before this day were treasure was something that I appreciated, something that I loved, that I wanted to remember because I knew it wasn't coming back. And then the fear began to kick in as this unknown person coming to pick me up. This person who all I knew was he has been paid an amount of money to bring me across the border to see my mother, to reunite me with my mother. I hear Carol Salva all the time blowing up the word hope. And I can tell you that that is exactly the word that I had told my sisters on that day that we were picked up by a smuggler. Manitas, a coyote is going to pick us up. Someone who we are putting our hope in their hands. Someone who has received an amount of money to take us to see mom. Someone who has a plan for us, a prepared a path for us to come to the United States. Little did we know that as soon as we get into that vehicle, we were going to lose contact with mom. So for two months, we were not able to communicate with her and she was not able to find out where we were or what had happened to us. We were in different motels, different rooms, looking at people going in and out with the same hope beaming in their face, just like we were, thinking, are we going to go tomorrow? Are we going to join mom tomorrow? What's going to happen tomorrow? Day by day, night by night, all we could do was put our head on the pillow and hope and pray that tomorrow the sun was going to come out and it was going to be that day that finally we see mom. For two months, it was a day of hoping and hoping and hoping. I do thank God that nothing bad happened to us on the journey here. Even though we rode trains and cars and taxis and a lot of different transportation. And you see the picture here in the middle where my sister snapped that picture. I can already feel feel it. I still feel it thinking about what am I going to do when I get to the United States? What's it going to be like? What, what am I, I going to become? Those dreams were taking effect in my mind and in my heart until finally we make it to the United States. Of course, the documentation is false. And as soon as we hand it to the immigration agent, I can still feel my hand shaking as I hand that fake passport. And it could have been the fake passport or maybe my face that gave it away, but they noticed that we had come here undocumented. We were busted, in other words. We get pulled over to the side. And just the idea of standing in front of an immigration agent, agent still hits me today. Just a couple of years ago, I traveled to Mexico and on my way back, when I handed my passport to the immigration agent, my hand was shaking and I was still thinking about 25 years ago when I did the exact same thing that was happening in that moment again, reliving that same day. We get pulled into a room 
getting ready for deportation and the questioning, what are you doing here? You need to go back. You don't belong here. You need to find your mom. Where is she? She needs to take you back. All of that through a translator. I remember seeing my little sisters and our smuggler getting fingerprint, getting ready to go back home, they will say, when really I was traveling here to make this my home, a place where I can find greener grass and a place where I can give, not just take, because I knew my potential. I knew what I could do. I knew what I could give. But I was getting the impression that I was here just to take. Luckily, my grandmother, who lives here in the United States as an American citizen, showed up and claimed us. She brought proof that she was my mother's mother. And my mother had proved that she was our mother. So instead of fingerprints for deportation, we received fingerprints to enter the United States with a permanent resident, an opportunity for legally being here in the United States a new life, a new opportunity, not a bigger house, not a lot of money in my pocket, but it's just an opportunity of education, not sitting at a market selling oranges. I still had to help with my sisters and brother. That had not changed because it was my job. It was my um, opportunity to help with my siblings, even if I was here in the United States. So I walk here at this Martin Van Buren High School. And from sixth grade, I get enrolled all the way to the high school because I was 15 years old. So that student with interrupted education was kicking in. And something that was really ignored and is still ignored today is that family separation trauma that is ignored in schools. Here am I entering a school with so much need and attention for what I had experienced, but that was not looked as important. All I was feeling is that I was behind, that I was struggling, that I didn't speak English, that I was lacking some knowledge that everybody else was lacking, that I didn't have any knowledge, that I was ignorant, that I couldn't speak. I could speak. I gave presentations back in Guatemala. I did public speaking in my classrooms when I was running for Miss Independence in my school. So I knew how to do all of that. I just couldn't do it in English. But what happens is when our experiences as undocumented or as immigrants or as unaccompanied minors, when our experiences are not honored, it could have a lasting impression, and it did in my, in, my, in my life. Because my culture was not honored, because my language was not accepted or seen as important, then that's when, oh, no, she's got to have ESL classes. Oh, we got to, you know, she's, she's interrupted education. She's never going to learn. She has lies. She's sort of socioeconomic status and no English. All they can see is this. Those labels that instead of helping, they hindered that possibility of becoming what we came here to do, which is being successful, impacting others, changing the world, not here to take, but to give. And of course, once I started looking at that, that my language was not important, that my culture was not important, I packed it all in and I put it all away. Okay, I'm going to learn English. Okay, I'm going to pass this class. Okay, I'm going to make sure that I pass this test. I gave it all. Three in the morning with dictionaries spread out in my kitchen table. I'm going to learn this language. I'm going to pass this test. I'm going to pass this class. And it's just a matter of three years I was able to take this picture with a cap and gown. A picture with a cap and gown that all it did was lead into failure. Because it was the last time I was able to wear that cap and gown. There was an unrealized potential. It wasn't that I didn't pass a test. It's not the test. It's not getting a high school diploma. It's tapping into those potentials that are hidden within us is leaving a campus 
realizing that you're worth nothing, that you're good for nothing, that you came here to take instead of, you know, give. So I became a high school dropout at the age, 1997, the age of 19. Having this, Carol Salva says on her and says on her book, Boosting Achievement, that passion, persistent, and motivation are the key to success. If these are the key to success, the passion, the persistent, and the motivation, I had it. I had all of these three. But you know that my passion, my persistence, and my motivation were rooted or my experiences and everything that I had lived before I started school here in the United States. But because my experiences that I have lived were not honored, were not validated, were not taken into account, then all of this was packed away. There was no more passion. There was no more persistent. There was no more, no more motivation for anything. All I could do was working as a cashier scanning groceries. That insane beep of each grocery that reminded me that I have failed. That it doesn't matter how hard I had tried, I had failed. That it doesn't matter how many bathroom toilets my mother had cleaned, I have failed. That it doesn't matter how many hours she had worked as an undocumented person, I had failed. And I was getting ready to do that with my children. I get pregnant and here am I continuing with the same cycle of poverty, the same cycle of uneducated person. But it's not what we and what I had within me. It wasn't until I met Angie Power, a first grade teacher who interviewed me for a teacher assistant position. With just a high school diploma, she asked, tell me your story. My story, what, what, why would you wanna hear my story? But you know what, that's all I had. Yeah, I had a high school diploma and my story. Here's my high school diploma, here's my story. I did this, I did that, I, I explained everything that had happened before this day. And they saw it as a potential. What? You did all of that? Oh yeah, you are getting hired. You are helping me teach first graders. And I worked alongside with Angie Power for eight years. She took me under her wing until I got my associate's degree, my bachelor's degree, my license to teach English as a second language, and my master's. You see, if I would have been one of those who do not have potential, I would have never achieved any of this. But because someone tapped into my potential, I was able to achieve the degrees that I have able to achieve. And it's not just about the degrees. It's about how you feel. It's about knowing that you do have something within you and now you can get it out and impact others. Because and then all these opportunities began to pop out for me to be able to share my story, all these platforms to be able to share, amplifying like we're talking today, amplifying our students voices, all these opportunities, not screen, fame, and blah, blah. No, these are opportunities just like our students need. And of course, I began working with students. And as soon as I walked, I walked into my classroom, I promised myself I was going to begin making a difference because that's what you do as an educator. You make a deal. You don't teach content. Yes, you do teach content. We get paid to teach. I'm a teacher. I know. We get paid to teach. But beyond that, we're making a difference. We're leaving a legacy because what they do becomes your legacy. So here we are with all of my students making a huge impact, writing their stories, validating who they are, publishing their stories in books and in magazines and sharing their stories with younger students, providing 
platforms for students to show that their experiences are shaping who they are. Knowing that teaching is not neutral, in comunidad says, our words, our actions, and even our silence on issues that matter to our students and families reveal our beliefs about humanity and teaching. You need to have a vision for your students, not a fake, oh, I believe in you. No, really believing that our immigrant students came here with passion, persistence, and motivation, and knowing that there is a possibility for them to become productive citizens, not getting a high school diploma, to be lifelong learners so they can continue learning the rest of their lives, become world changers, which means impacting others with the same abilities that they have today and making a difference. I'm making a difference today. Our students with their experiences are going to become difference makers for others who come. But do you have that vision for your students? Or are they coming into your classrooms and we are oppressing their language and we are oppressing their experiences and then forcing them to pack it up? No one ever told me, or there was no sign to say, don't speak English. But just the fact that it was not, uh, oh, I'm sorry, don't speak Spanish, but just the fact that I was not given the opportunity to use my language was enough for me to say it's not important and I pack it away. So how is it that we can unpack our students potential, that potential that gets hidden inside because of trauma, because of lack of opportunities in the classrooms. What, what do we need to do? So here, the first thing we need to do is affirming, letting them know, like we see them, like for real, see them, not just say, hello, Emily, how are you? Welcome in. No, like, who are you? Tell me your story. Tell me who you are. I, you're important. I'm glad you're in my classroom figured out what is it that they can do. The first thing that I ask my students is, okay, tell me how much you read, how much you write in your home language. What did you used to do in your home country? You like soccer? Okay. Do you like this? Find is it, what is their passion? What drives their motivation? And then funds of knowledge. When I came to the United States, I had already taken care of Four kids. I knew how to do shopping. I knew how to do, well, not shopping as clothing, but grocery shopping for the house. I knew how to do presentation at schools. I knew how to interact with kids and telling stories and the knowledges that my mother had passed on from storytelling. And then language practices that Spanglish, you know, if students, I have students who come from El Salvador. And they already speak a little bit of English because they they their self um, learn how to they self teach how to speak the language and they come in here and they start Spanglishing which is perfect. Are we validating that language practice or we're telling them oh you got to stick to Spanish or English you can't mix it no. What language practice do they have that we can allow them to continue using. Remember, as a teacher, you have the power to either make or break your students' experiences in your classroom. And then provide those platforms for storytelling. You're going to get ready to hear Jorge Juarez, a former student. He graduated last summer. But he's going to tell you, and you're going to hear how storytelling is important to him. Experiences that students bring are highly influential, and we need to take those into account. So um, here is Jorge. I'm going to play a video because he had to work. He recorded a video, and I'm going to have you listen to him, share a little bit of his story, and then I'll jump back in and share a little bit more. Please let me know if you do not hear it. Hello, everyone. How are you? 
My name is Jorge Antonio Juarez Gomez. I am from Guatemala. I am 19 years old and this is my short story of my life. Hola a todos, ¿cómo están? Mi nombre es Jorge Antonio Juarez Gómez. Soy de Guatemala, tengo 19 años y esta es mi pequeña historia de mi vida. I was born in Guatemala and I grew up with my grandparents for 15 years. Yo nací en Guatemala y crecí con mis abuelos por 15 años. When, when I was two years, um, my father immigrated to the United States. Cuando yo tenía dos años, mi papá emigró hacia Estados Unidos. I started from middle school to high school. And during the time, I was working at a hotel to help my grandparents and to pay my classes. Cuando yo estudiaba de middle school a high school, yo empecé a estudiar y también a trabajar en un hotel para ayudar a mis abuelos económicamente y, y pagar mis clases. After graduating high school, my father gave me the chance to come to the United States. Cuando yo me había graduado de high school, mi papá me, me dio la oportunidad de venir a Estados Unidos y, y yo acepté, I accepted. Um, I was very, very um, sad because it was very difficult to leave my family, to leave my friends. Yo estaba muy triste porque era muy difícil para mí dejar a mi familia, dejar a mis amigos. Era una decisión muy fuerte la que tenía que tomar. I remember the traveling uh, 16 days from Guatemala to Mexico. And when I come to USA, um, immigration got me um, in the jail that I was in. It was very, very cold. And I was there for six days. Cuando yo había entrado, me recuerdo que cuando yo venía de, de, de Guatemala a, a México, yo me tomé 16 días. Y cuando ya estaba en Estados Unidos, migración me agarró y me metió a, a la cárcel donde yo estuve durante seis días. Estaba muy, muy frío ese lugar, pero lo pude resistir. After getting out of the jail, I was able to meet my father. Cuando yo, después de salir de la, de, de la cárcel, yo estaba eh, ya listo para conocer a mi papá. Estaba muy feliz. Um, I learned later, I started to go to Concord High School. And everything was very, very, very different for me. Um, cuando yo, yo después empecé a, a estudiar en la... Concord High School y todo era muy, muy difícil para mí. I start to learn English, but it was hard for me to understand. And thank God for giving me the teachers to help me. Cuando, cuando yo empecé a aprender inglés, era muy difícil para mí entenderlo y, y y también escribirlo y leerlo como muchos pero lo doy gracias a Dios porque me dio unos maestros muy buenos que me ayudaron uh, un, one day I meet Miss Frances <laughs> I love the way she, she teaches and the passion she talks the passion that she talks with everybody my friends Um, cuando yo conocí a Miss Francis, eh, 
me enamoré de la forma en la que ella habla y, y de la pasión con la que ella habla. Me enamoré por completo y, 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 y fue una de las experiencias más bonitas. Um, ESL uh, was a big help for me because uh, ESL keep me more confident and to myself, confident to myself. It wasn't easy, but I graduated and And I want to say thank you, Miss Francis, for your tips, for your help, and everything. Thank you so much. ESL eh, es, fue una gran ayuda para mí. Eh, me ayudó a, a, en mi confianza en mí mismo. Y, y, y yo estoy muy agradecido con Miss Francis. All right. Ah, <laughs> there we go. So this is Jorge. Jorge, um, I might give you a little bit of feedback and I really appreciate him taking the opportunity to share this story with you. And I hope you found his um, little story um, impactful as much as I did. But I, um, I met Jorge in the summer of 2018 when I was still working at the elementary school. And I had taken a two week, two weeks uh, position to teach newcomers at the high school level. I really did not want to transition to the high school. That was not my idea. It was just a two week uh, summer camp that they had designed for newcomers. So I took it, and, well, you know, it's, it's good pay, but little did I know that I was gonna meet, meet Jorge Juarez. And, in all of the newcomers in that classroom. So I walk in that classroom and I lost it. Uh, they were newcomers, they are reflecting my experiences and reflecting me, you know, years ago when I was just a 15 year old sitting in a classroom waiting for the teacher to walk in and not understanding a word. Jorge had so much energy. He quickly told me he was from Guatemala and he had so much energy and I couldn't help but think and see me when I started high school. He had so much potential, so much motivation. So she, he, he brought enough credits to be enrolled as a junior. So in, from 2018 to 2020, he was able to acquire all of the credits required for graduation. And here I wanted to show you a painting that he left me after he graduated and left. Um, so it's a gentleman that made a huge impact in my life as much as hopefully, like he said in the video, I impact his life as well. I wanna show you this little quick video uh, where he was doing a presentation using sketch noting. So he couldn't really write a summary of the reading that he had done with his peers, but he had, because he was so good at drawing, he decided to draw and sketch note his notes and share his learning through sketch noting. So hopefully you would like this video. Okay. Destroy, destroy, destroy it and everything in the path, in the path, um, house, arboles. <laughs> How do you say arboles? Um, tree? Yes. Tree, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, in Joshua Wula in the class math, uh, saw the volcano routine and and they um like what do they have to get que se pusieron mask 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 mask, mask. why because <laughs> the poison po poison gas poison yes ah, so me acuerdo. um and, <laughs> and This is cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you can see lava flows. Yeah. And you can see the school. And you can see. Uh, How's your mother? Joshua. Joshua. Uh, Joshua Gula. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the friends. The friends. 
All right. So this is one of the many videos that I have of him taking risk. He was one of those students who it didn't matter how it sounded. It didn't matter uh, if they were laughing at him or he just took chances and he was you know, throwing it out there and he, he made it, that success that we want to see in all of our students. And you can just tell that it's not just about him getting this diploma you see in his hands. See right here is his dad. They're proud of him getting a diploma, but he goes beyond getting a diploma. Hopefully in the video, you, you get a sense of his how proud he is of who he is, how exciting he feels telling about his experiences, even though her little side where he was telling the story, that's always going to be there because those experiences are here. Those experiences are here, but those experiences are what make us you know, now he has a baby and now those stories are going to carry on to his child as well. So I'm so excited for what he has accomplished. If we want to see our students thrive, just like I showed you with Jorge and many stories I can tell you about many of my students, you know what we need to do? We need a system, an educational system that places our students' experiences at the forefront. Curriculum that tells them that their experiences matter. Curriculum and opportunities for them to share their experiences and share what they can do versus those labels that tells them that they cannot do something. So here we are with the opportunity for learning. You, you heard from my story. You heard from Jorge. You want to hear two more presentations. Take all of this as tools for your uh, teacher build. What are you going to do tomorrow when that student comes into your classroom? Let me just tell you, you need to be prepared. You need to build a network in your classroom where as soon as your student opens up and starts sharing their stories, you grab the phone and call that network, that social worker, that guidance counselor, that principal. That's what I have to do because we begin reading stories. When I tell you about you know, using curriculum and putting your students at the forefront, you're going to start students opening up and this, they begin to cry and they begin to tell you stories that sometimes you may not want to hear because they're so painful, but those are necessary. It's a healing process to be able to share our experiences, but don't do it alone in your four walls. Be sure to have a network. Be sure that you have a collaborative community that is going to support you and understand that. Maybe before you begin to open a window and a door to get to know your students, make sure you and your colleagues have talked about it. What happened in the event of the student saying this? What do I do in the event of a student sharing that? Because I have heard so many stories that all I have to do is just close the door, get the phone, and bring in a specialist in my classroom. But those stories are so important to share. And when they feel validated, when they feel honored, when they feel that we are there to hear the stories, they feel much better in other classrooms. So this right here is an ESL classroom. It's a classroom where the opportunity for newcomers to learn the basics of English and of course, learn and read about their background and get to know our system here, how it works. But in the end, when they feel that we are that we're accepting them when they walk into an economics classroom when they walk into a math classroom when they walk into a science classroom they already feel like they belong that they can speak their home language that they are part of the big picture that big vis big vision that we talked about earlier that we are there not just to give them a paper of high school diploma but to prepare them to be world changers so here it is Jorge now with a voice 
And now he's going to encounter others and be able to say, hey, you've got this. I got another video. If you go to my YouTube channel, I got another video of Jorge encouraging, teaching the ABCs to another newcomer who came after he did. And he was cheering him up and making sure that he knew uh, to feel him, make him feel that he belonged in the classroom. So um, hopefully you uh, like here the story. All right, so it, I would love for you to um, contact me if you have any questions and maybe there was something I did not cover. I have all sorts of professional media, uh, social media accounts. These are all professionals. I do blog. I blogged my story and I do blog about what I do in my classroom. So if there's ever anything I can um, help you with, I would love to stay in contact with you before I go. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hopefully you took a screenshot or in a website, they'll have all of this um, for you to get a hold of. But I, before I go, I'm an avid reader and I can't help but providing you with some books to help you understand an immigrant journey. Yes, that is a great way to build empathy to understand others. Because if you say, oh, I've never experienced that. I don't know what it is to leave another country. I don't know what it is to be sitting in a classroom and not understanding that you have literature that can help you as a teacher. So of course I read a lot of literature that I can encourage my students to read. So one of the ones is from uh, Lulu de Lacre. Us in Progress. I highly recommend this. It's a middle grade uh, novel, but of course, you as a teacher, you will learn a lot about um, undocumented and unaccompanied minors and a lot of other stories of newcomers here in the United States. The new one, No Somos de Aquí, We Are Not From Here by um, Jenny Torres Sanchez. You are going to be bawling at the end of this story, but I promise you, this is a great story that is going to impact your life when it comes to understanding what happens with different journeys, not like mine, because I didn't ride on the top of La Bestia, but it's important to read literature like that to make us understand. I just finished Alexandra Diaz, both of these books, oh my gosh, highly recommended. The Only Road and the new one, Santiago's Road Home. This one, a 12 year old by himself with other unaccompanied minors crossing the border, cr cr getting on the, uh, across the riv river. And what I love about Santiago's story is that it tells you about those funds of knowledge. Like when students come here to the United States, they have crossed cities in so much danger and they made it through. Yes, it's fiction, but hey, it's happening. It's happening for real in real life. You have Francisco Storks, uh, disappear. Oh, you are going to be fascinated by this one. Teenagers crossing, um, trying to flee um, persecution in Mexico. If you like a PD book, En Comunidad, you heard me just mention quite a few quotes about En Comunidad. What I love about this PD book is that it gives you a lot of lessons and a list of books of how to help your students embrace their journey. This is the book that taught me that it's not a story, it's a journey because he keeps going. Look at Jorge. Jorge just right now finished high school, but his journey continues. And that's what our lives are all about. Those experiences that keep building up to make us who we are. I cannot tell you enough about sometimes. Every time I see, the, even the cover, I, it breaks me. It's such a touching picture book. Of course, it's by John Silas, so Ugo Yu Ibarra, but, but it's just such a cute book that talks about how and why families have to be separated and what happens to those kids when they're here in the U.S. and parents are still trying to cross the borders to get here to them. If you're into graphic novels, Manuelito, oh my gosh, this story is going to break your heart. You need to read that one. And of course, Yuji Morales, Dreamers. This is the book where 
I learned about unpacking our potential. In this book, Juji Morales packs everything inside a backpack and crosses the border with a baby to become just, you know, a, a citizen here in the United States. But she realizes that she has to keep everything packed up because her voice is not being heard, because her experiences are not validated, until she gets to the library and those books begin to make her realize that she matters, that her language matters, that her culture matters. When she begins to read that literature that is impacting her, her book bag opens up and all of those uh, cultures and all of those things that she brought from Mexico I'll pour out a book that I use with my newcomers in order for them to learn about the journey and what it is to be living and carrying a packed book bag with potentials and not unpacking it as the way it should be. Sorry, I took some time to share some of these books, but I, I, I am high, you can see my bookshelf behind me. I am a believer that literature, through literature, we can get to our students' hearts and mind, that through literature, we can heal hearts, that through literature, we can open opportunities and amplify their voices. Because when they see that their experiences are published in books, then why can they share their own? So I get my students, I use the app, the app Write Reader, and the students publish their own books. You see how Jorge did his story bilingual? because that's what we did in my classroom. He wrote it in Spanish and then he translated it in English. He did the same thing now that I asked him to share his story because what we teach our students is gonna carry on for the rest of their lives. So are we teaching them to appreciate and love their journeys or are we teaching them to get it packed and keep it packed away? So this is all I have for you. I know I'm ending a few minutes, just a couple of minutes early, but maybe there's a question I can answer. If you guys call a question that will be good for the whole audience. Go ahead, John. I wanted to mention a couple of things, Emily, that she, I don't, she may be shy to mention, but Emily is writing her book. The draft is finished. Oh, and can I tell them a little bit about it? Yes. Emily, you, Emily? <laughs> tell them all about it. Her book Letters to my students. It is letters from, uh, oh my gosh, I'm getting choked up thinking about it. Cause I remember when uh, we met Emily and started talking to her about writing her, her story and she was kind of stuck. And I asked her, I said, Emily, can you just picture somebody sitting in a chair, one of your students right here. And then just, what would you say to the student? And uh, she started tearing up. She started telling her story. And then, so, she wrote her story as uh, letters to her students. And is Jorge one of the students? Is he one of yes. the students? Uh, yes. He's yes. one of the students who she wrote a letter to. And so her story is going to be her story mixed in with uh, just letters to her kids, is sharing her life with them. And in those letters, sharing that life with you. And so uh, I can't wait for this these letters to be uh, shared with you guys. Uh, had a chance to read them and... Um, <laughs> It's amazing. So, uh, and I am honored. Very, I am honored uh, that Silence, you know, that you are giving me this platform to be able to to write this book. It's just a dream come true, and and I just I can't imagine, you know, having my book amongst all of you giants. There, it's just it's an amazing opportunity. I'm grateful. Oh, Pam Broussard just typed in there that her students got to review the book and they couldn't put it down. They loved it. She uh, some students yes. at a school and. Yes. In high school, most students have already read it, and, and they they couldn't wait. So, uh, we don't have a pub date yet. Somebody's asking, which we did, but it's just the draft is just finished, and and that's where she where she is right now. But we're we're excited that she finished the draft. Even that is more than, than a lot of us can do yes, sometimes. Thank so thank you. Um, also, I wanted to share with you uh, just just a few things. Uh, first of all, we have some more people that have uh, donated, and I wanted to, to share some of of their names. We have. Uh, Ivan Tamayo and Veronica Burnett and Sarah Goodry and Diana Delaney, Annie Smith, Kathleen Fernandez, uh, Hannah Davis, uh, Jamie Wolf, Alejandro Carballo, Laura Gardner, Stephanie De Leon, and M Emmy Tomita. And uh, we are also just to remind you we're matching donations, and so this your your stuff really counts. Somebody had. Uh, 
sent me a private message asking, can I share this on Facebook? And please, and if you want any kind of things you want to do to share this, because uh, these kids like that uh, they need it. Um, let me ask a couple of questions. Emily, would you mind real quick sharing your screen again uh, with your contact information? Just uh, real quickly, the, 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 the sheet so they get a photograph of it. Some people didn't quite have a time. And I also wanted to ask you if it's not too much trouble, uh, maybe Anna, you could talk to Emily about this afterwards during the next presentation, if there's something we could do to get, I, I want an annotated bio of some kind. Uh, and I'd love to share a link with it, with uh, the people who participated, those, those uh, not bi bibliography, not a biography, a, a bibliography, sorry, wrong word. But just those, uh, uh, the books that you just shared, if at least a list of those, uh, I, I, some of those I had read and some of those I, I was not familiar with. And I was like, no, it's going too fast. I, I really would love to have I'm a- I'm sorry. A, <laughs> maybe you could put it on your blog and then we could share it uh, afterwards. The, well, yeah, the they are. If they, if they go to my blog, there is a section called Passionate Readers and it's linked to my, good, my uh, Goodreads account. And I have logged all the books I read. But if you want that specific list that I share right now, I can just, uh, I'll give, I'll send you an email with a list and we can post Perfect. that. Give it to me and to Anna? Sure, I'll do that. Thank you. And then also, would you be able to put a link to the, 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 the part of your blog? Because some of us, I mean, it's harder for us to navigate than others. If you just put it into the chat, a link to the part of the blog where you've got the, uh, the book, the, the, the part you just mentioned, what did you call it? The readers corner yeah passion the readers yes passionate readers if you could just paste that uh into the the, the link I, I i think that would be really helpful for okay everybody. i will do that mm -hmm. and so uh before we uh before we take our break i just wanted to I, to do the school teacher thing and get a little reflection because you know uh one of the things that emily talked about was it's important to be intentional and about your system about it's not just about moving our hearts, we have to move our hands and heads. It's one of the reasons I, I like to look up Charity Navigator before I, know, I donate to something to make sure that what we're doing really counts. So we don't just wanna be inspired by Emily. We also want to think about what we're doing. Uh, if you're an educator in the classroom, but we have a lot of folks that aren't educators here. Welcome all of you. We have some uh, people of some doing all different kinds of things here for, uh, that, that are not educators. But I'd like us to think about based on, on what you've heard from Emily. On, on what she shared with us. Some things, and I'll give you a couple of sentence stems, either I will, I'll try, or we should. One of those things, what are some things that we might do uh, that could make an impact in our classrooms or in our communities based on what you heard Emily say? And if you would type that into the chat real quick. Either I will, we should. I'm gonna do mine first. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. Sharing stories with reluctant educators. Oh my gosh, Kimmy, I so agree with that. Giving students time and space to share their stories. Read books that tell kids stories sharing recommended books with our classrooms, build strong class communities to create safe spaces for students to share their stories, excellent. Oh, we got the YouTube channel, okay. So at that, uh, oh, ways to contact elected officials and inform them of things, thank you. Tell students stories to use books as role models develop activity called Unpack Backpack that helps kids share their stories. Oh, that's really cool. Tammy, love that. Unpack your backpack, something that helps them share their stories and dreams. If you, yeah, that's excellent. Okay, well, we're getting ready uh, for our break. Uh, Orly, I, I know you texted it to me, but I, I didn't see what it was. What, what are we at right now in terms of our fundraiser? We're at? We are officially at $3,446. Woohoo! So we are getting close, guys. This is excellent. Thank you. So we've got uh, two and a half, or not two and a half, we've got two more hours left. We're going to take a break now, a little 15 minute break. And so 
Anna, is it 1125 or is it 1130? What, what, when is the, when is it's he starting? It's not 15 minutes anymore. Now it's 10. Oh, um, it's totally fine. So it's about 1114 here, central time. Uh, Dr. Jose Luis Zelaya will be beginning at 1125. So you guys have about an 11 minute break right now. Remember we talk central time. We don't, it's the best time zone, obviously. So we don't care about your other time zones. I'm kidding, but that's our time zone right now. So we'll be back in about 11 minutes. I'm going to share the slide deck again with all of you that has the link to donate to KIND as well as the information you saw at the beginning with the schedule, Cypress Education Professional Development Opportunities, and that will be looped throughout. Um, quick reminder, and I'll keep reminding you, please respond to all panelists and attendees. Um, there's a lot of phenomenal comments that we've been getting through and only us as panelists have been seeing them. So just be attentive to select panelists and attendees, and then we will see all of you back in about 10 minutes, 10 minutes, wherever you are. Thank you. And thank you, Emily.
All right, everybody. Welcome back. We are precisely on time. I love that. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Um, I do want to take a moment, though, and thank those of you that have been donating throughout. We're getting more and more in as time goes by, and it's just a wonderful testament to what we're hearing today, and we really hope that that continues throughout our morning together. So without further ado, though, to keep us going on track, he is going to introduce Dr. Jose Luis Zelaya for all of us. Thanks, Anna. Dr. Jose Luis Zelaya grew up in San Pedro Sula in Honduras. Jose went to work at a young age to help support his family. After Hurricane Mitch in 1998, his mom and sister fled, leaving Jose by himself. After living on the streets, he decided to make the journey north. Arriving in the United States alone, Jose was reunited with his family and enrolled in the seventh grade. He was encouraged by his seventh grade science teacher, Mrs. Wright, to continue his schooling. Jose did so until he graduated with a PhD in urban education from Texas A&M University. He is a determined, creative mentor and friend who finds joy in sharing his craft, playing soccer, and spending time with his family. He continues to support his community and students through his work with Dr. Zelaya Educational Consulting, LLC. We are so privileged to have him here today and handing it off to you, Dr. Zelaya. Well, howdy. I am very, very, very excited uh, to be here with such an incredible community, with such an incredible family uh, who cares, who loves, uh, and is passionate about doing this groundwork. I am very, very humbled to be here uh, with you, connecting from the beautiful metropolis of Cali Station, Texas, the home of Texas A&M University. Uh, it's incredible, incredible to be able to be here because although uh, we are separated by distance, at the same time, we are connected through values, through our dreams, through our missions. Uh, it's an incredible honor to be able uh, to partake in this very powerful conference, um, because not only do we get to talk about today, but we also get to talk about the past and the future, because that's what guides our thinking. That's what guides our heart. It is that contextual understanding of experiences of unaccompanied minors, and to be able to understand that evolution of who they are, their resilience, their grit, their aspirations, their perseverance, their courage, because it's, it's, it's beautiful to be able to be here because each one of us have our individual stories. Each one of us have our reasons for serving. And each one of us are here today because we care. You see, this is beautiful because as we think about oftentimes systemic work, systemic power, it is, it is, it is, it is the choir that makes the song sound beautiful. So to be able to be here with people who love this work, to be able to be people who are passionate, to be able to be a part of, of, of the beautiful work that Silent Education is doing as they continue to empower English learners, newcomers uh, with, with rapid language acquisition. It's incredible to be able to be part of this conversation. It's an honor to be able to be part of such a community that has been doing this groundwork for such an incredible amount of time. So I am nothing but humbled and grateful to be able to have the stage, to be able to have the next few minutes to be able to share not only my story, but also the experiences of one company minors as I have the opportunity to see them evolve throughout life. It is, it is beautiful to be here. And as I seek to share my story, I, I am not here to share a story of sadness. I am not here to simply talk a story of pain, but instead to be able to realize how within that pain there is power and how that power through education and through educators and through leaders as yourself can turn into generational legacy. So it's beautiful for me to be able to be here. I thank John Seidlitz and the incredible team um, for the platform, for the opportunity. And I thank the entire community of educational leaders across the nation who have joined today who are here on this Zoom call and who are also connecting uh, on YouTube. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for being part of the conversation. As I think about unaccompanied minors, as I think about their, their experiences and their, and, their, and, and their potential and their capacity, there is no way, no way in this world that I can think of myself or my story as an example story. There is no way that I can think of myself as something extraordinary because whenever I reflect on my journey, 
I also see the same reflection in the eyes of one of company miners who's just got to this country. Whenever I see their eyes and I see their hopes and I see their aspirations, I see them thinking that an education could change their generations. So whenever I meet you, you are that catalyst of knowledge that can continue to be able to bring hope, esperanza to their hearts. So it's beautiful to be here. So as I share my story, please know that I come from a place of gratitude because it was educators who inspire and empower me to be who I am today. Please know that I come from a place of humility to be able to join the field with people who have done this work for a very long time. But at the same time, I come from a very insightful perspective because the experiences that I have lived are experiences that I understand because I live them. I remember whenever I was five years old, you see, Whenever we think about poverty, whenever we think about the, the different levels of, 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 of low socioeconomic status in the United States, we have this definition of poverty. And the definition of poverty in the United States is often defined as if you make less than, 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 than the equation, if you will make less than minimum wage, multiply times 30 times 52 a week, you come to find out that there is a line of, of about $12,000, that if you make less than $12,000, you are considered to be below poverty. But if you were to grab that same amount of money, that same amount of line, line of poverty, and you were to take it to places like Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, Venezuela, Cuba, you will come to realize that the equation changes, that the equation changes, because I grew up in a very different environment. You see, Honduras, it's beautiful. Honduras is such an incredible country. Oh my goodness, the mountains, the people, the food, the culture, the language, the soccer, the sports. It is such an incredible, beautiful country. Like I love Honduras. In fact, Honduras is a plural word for hondo, which means deep. So Honduras is the deepness of beauty. It's the incredible, the incredible Mariana Trench of understanding of understanding where pain originates due to poverty, where you have a society that is so hardworking, where you have a society that is so caring, that has values, that, that, that looks at this country and, and or showers or, or bathrooms or, or, or places where we, would, where we would shower in the morning were not bathrooms. There were waterfalls and there were rivers and there were oceans and there were lakes. Honduras is so beautiful. But Honduras also lives under a very, defi on a very def different definition of poverty. Honduras lives under what is called absolute levels of poverty. 48% of the Honduran population live under a line of poverty that has been defined by the United Nations to be between less than $2 a day. So whenever you redefine poverty, you will understand why it was that I grew up in a trash field. You'll understand how as a little kid, I remember whenever I grew up in this trash field, a trash field. A trash field where it was miles and miles of trash. I remember as a little kid, I would see a truck. A truck would come and there would, there would be trash dumped into this trash field. And as a kid, I would run into this trash to be able to find food, to be able to find bags, clothing, something to be able to strengthen the little chosita, the little, the little chanty in which we live. As a very young kid, I remember one day coming back from work, I was about five years of age. And I went into that little chanting in which we lived. And at the age of five years old, I had to experience how my little brother passed away due to an asthma attack. Poverty is not just an equation, it's not just a number line. It has created traumatic experiences in the lives of unaccompanied minors. I was 25 when I lost my brother. I would give up everything that I have ever gained in this world. I would give up everything, all type of wealth to be able to have no asito with me, but I can't. But education is healing. Education is powerful because as I go from shelter to shelter, as I visit facility from facility, as I meet on company minors at the border, I hear them say that they want to be doctors and they want to be nurses and they want to be in the medical field. So it empowers me because education can grab somebody's pain and turn it into power. Education is power. Education has the ability to grab a kid from a trash field. and turn them into one of your students. So how do we grab them from being one of your students to be Dr. Celaya, to be Dr. Martinez? Education gives us an ability to be able to create 
a different path for the same kids. I remember seeing my brother passed away. You see, every single day, every single day, I leave my house with at least $2 to be reminded that the day my brother passed away, if I could have had $2, I would have been able to pay for a taxi. I would have been able to maybe take my brother to a hospital or maybe, maybe done something, but I didn't have $2. So my brother, my brother passed. I remember being seven years old, living in this very beautiful country, in this very beautiful mountain-like, in the very warm, tropical weather country. Incredible. De baleadas, de horchata, de jugo de nance. Oh, my goodness. I'm telling you, there is so much power. There is a treasure in the culture that these children bring through their experiences. As I think of my journey as a seven-year-old kid, I was on my way to school on a bus whenever, unfortunately, due to the high levels of violence, due to rampant destruction associated to war zone conditions, I remember being seven years old on my way to school when the bus got stopped by gang members. And that was the first time that I was stabbed on my head. I experienced violence very differently. But it's not only my story, because as I meet children throughout the nation, and I meet them, and I meet Walter, and I meet Jose, and I meet Josue, and I see their faces, I also see scars. I also see experiences that they have gone through as kids, as children. Violence is not only a number, it's not only data, it's not only quantitative analysis. It is also case studies. We must understand the experiences of these children before we can even begin to teach them anything. We must come from a place of caring and love and kindness and compassion and humanity because that's what's going to be able to activate prior knowledge. They are so smart. They are so courageous. Maybe, maybe it is the trauma that limits their ability to communicate. But let's not misunderstand unaccompanied minors, English language learners, newcomer students, turning to first generation college students. And they also change the legacy of their entire families. This is too personal for me, just the same way that is too personal to you. So I thank you for doing this work. I thank you for creating this platform for us to be able to share our experiences and to be able to amplify the stories of our children. I remember as a kid, I grew up working very hard as a little kid because my mother taught me that there was integrity in work. Because my mother taught me that before you eat your first meal, you should work to be able to deserve that meal. So as a kid, I remember walking to the, to, to the rivers to go sometimes like do laundry and wash people's clothing at a rock. I remember going to the forest and just picking up leña and just wood and being able to go to the roads and selling it to the people that were passing by. Or I remember just going to places and grabbing tamarindo from trees or mangoes from trees or coconuts from trees and then going to markets to sell them. I was very savvy as a kid. I am only the evolution of the same kid. I haven't really changed. And that's exactly who's in your classroom. The assets, the knowledge, the skills, the ability, the strategic thinking that they bring to the table and to the classroom is empowering and is enriching to the learning of our system. As a little kid, I remember going to, to stadiums and selling guns. I remember going to, to parks and, and I remember that I would, I would, sell, I would sell newspapers. I remember that I would get inside of buses and I would sing and then I would beg people for, for, for money. I was that kid that went to restaurants and would go into the trash cans to be able to look for pollo because pollo, like, like chicken, was one of the things that people eat the most, pollo con tajadas. And I remember as a kid, I remember as a kid grabbing, grabbing wood and I remember grabbing a hammer and nails. And I remember as a little kid, I remember building myself a shoebox and with that little shoebox, I went to plazas and I went to parks and I went to different restaurants and I would shine people's shoes. I was the great shoe shiner. And that's how I developed an entrepreneur mentality. That's how I developed the idea of survival not in the place where survival of the fittest is a very real thing. As a very young kid, I understood how to work very hard. However, due to the absolute levels of poverty and the rampant levels of violence, it was very difficult. Whenever I was nine, 10 years old, that was the environment in which I grew up. 
And I don't share this to share about a sad story. I share this so that people can understand the story before we embrace the glory. People would want to just embrace the glory without understanding the story. I am proud of my roots. I am proud of my past. I am proud of my pain because it is that pain that has empowered me to be able to be where I am today. You know me, I vergüenzo. I can't be embarrassed of my past. I can't be embarrassed of my pain. I am proud because that pain and that difficulties and those challenges are my point of reference to be able to be grateful. And it is exactly those same concepts that these children have in your classroom. It is the same people that you are guiding. You are guiding the next promised land as you do this work. I remember as a little kid, I, I worked very hard. But I also remember in year 1998, there was a hurricane, a hurricane by the name of Hurricane Mitch. And Hurricane Mitch created extreme destruction. Almost nearly 12,000 people lost their lives. It rained and it rained and it rained after days and days and days and the rain never stopped. And imagine living in a trash field, in a trash field where there are no internet access or notification, ambulance, or even the military to be able to go in there because of the levels of violence, because of the levels of poverty, because the places had flooded. And as a little kid, I remember how my mother grabbed my younger sister and I, and we escaped the trash field into higher terrains to be able to find refuge. And as we were walking the carreteras, as we were walking the roads, we saw people come out of the trash field as if it was the apocalypse, as if it was times of revelation, as if it was differently. The end of the world, people were zombie-like, people were desperate, people were filled with blood looking for their family members, the level of desperation that a natural disaster can cause to a country that lives in absolute poverty is something we would never be able to understand. But we can have compassion for it. But we can be kind. And we can be patient. And we can be loving. And we can be respectful to their pains. And understand their traumas. Because the same experiences that I migrated from are the same experiences that your children have migrated from. If not worse. Because I experienced Hurricane Mitch. Many of the children that are migrating right now have experienced Oeta, Iota, volcano eruptions, floodings, like, 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 like government coups. It has been very, very challenging for a lot of these people that are now migrating. And I remember after the hurricane, my mother made the decision to migrate to the United States with my younger sister because we didn't have enough resources to be able to migrate together. Because we didn't have the ability to, to just take a plane or go to the embassy to apply for a visa, we didn't understand. We didn't know we were breaking a human law. We never, meet, we never meant to be disrespectful. We never meant to, to break a highly complex of system of immigration, we didn't know. If, if we would could have, if we could have, we would have done it. In fact, if we didn't have to migrate, we would have never migrated because our country is so beautiful. But the desperation was enormous. The pain was just out of control. And people started forming caravans. People started forming groups because they thought that if they could make it to the United States, that life could be different. And they took a journey of hope through a journey of hell. And they migrated. And my mother migrated to the United States with my younger sister, sacrificing the concept of being together for the concept of being alive. And my mother brought my little sister who was five years old and she came to the United States because as a kid, I could defend myself, I could work. So my mother migrates to the United States through the mountains, through the rivers, through the desert, and eventually makes it to Houston, Texas, where she started living in Casa Juan Diego, which was an immigration shelter. 
and she stayed in the section for all women where they would help new arrivals. And then all of a sudden, my mother would start helping me out in Honduras. She would start helping me with a little bit of food here and there, money here and down. But the goal was over family reunification. The idea was always so that they could send for me. But as a little kid, I didn't understand many of these things. The already accumulated trauma plus family separation became something out of my control. I remember. I remember leaving the trash field and all of a sudden started like sleeping in parks and stadiums and just traveling from place to place to place as a kid. Oftentimes we have this conversation in the United States around police brutality. But whenever we talk about the Triangle region, we must understand that the conversation is around military brutality, that the militaries are walking around communities, destroying villages associated to people that come from very poor and humble backgrounds. I remember as a kid, I was sleeping in parks and the militaries would come, the Contras, the Los Escuadrones de la Muerte, the dead squads, because they were looking for gang members because the country would have a national curfew between after 6 p.m. Anybody that would be home, like, like, like if you were not home after 6 p.m., imagine that, imagine that, imagine being a place where you can be home after 6 p.m. And all of a sudden you are a street child. You live in the streets. You have no place to go but parks, but places to be able to sleep. And all of a sudden in the middle of the night, the military squads would come and they would grab us. They would wake us up and they would gra grab batons or their AK-47 and they would snap us in our legs. They would break our legs. I am only 34 years old, but in my body, I already have 14 surgeries. I got eight screws that hold my right knee together. This was this has be, been reconstructed several times. This is metal. I had to get my tonsils, my uvula removed. I've been shot due to the violence of a very beautiful country that experiences pain. The shooting happened after I was just simply playing soccer. I remember as a 13 year old kid after living two years without my mother, I was just simply playing soccer and whenever there was a drop by shooting. And what did I do? I do. I did what every single time I did. I ran because every time, imagine you're eating at a place and there's a shooting, you run. Imagine you are like at a cathedral or a church begging for money and there's a shooting, you run. Imagine you're like in school and there's militaries and gang members coming inside to fight because of recruitment efforts. You run, you run, 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 run. Then all of a sudden you're at a sporting event and gang members or, 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 or different soccer teams start fighting with each other. You run. The concept of running for me was very natural so i did what i always did i ran and all of a sudden i realized that i was not fast enough and at the age of 13 years old i was shot twice in both of my arms so what did i do next i ran again and i ran to the united states i ran to a place of refuge I ran to a place that, that if I could just get there, my life would change. I ran to a place where my mom was. I just kept on running. I didn't know why I wanted to run. I just kept on running. I just kept running and running and running and running and running away because whenever I was in Guatemala, I met people who were trying to injure children, so I ran. Whenever I was in the desert and we met cartels through all the way, we ran. Whenever we were walking through the different rivers and we saw the militaries come, we ran. We ran and ran and ran. And all of a sudden, after 45 days of migrating, of being on top of the, on the, of the bestia, of being on the desert, I made it to the Rio Bravo, to the, to the river. And all of a sudden I swam across because I wanted to be with my mother. So I swim across the river and I started seeing all these things that were left behind by other children or families that had migrated, water bottles, clothing, shoes, toys. And I started screaming for my mom because I didn't know where my mom was. So I started like saying, my mom, my mom, my mom. And my mother was nowhere to be found. So I remember I just started walking the desert and then 
And then I just cried so much that, that I put myself to sleep. Like this very sublime feeling just came towards me. And, and I just remember falling asleep. And then all of a sudden, a man, a man on a green uniform came. And he woke me up. And I remember him giving me a bottle of water. And I remember being so thirsty. And I was given water. And then this man put me inside of a patrol car, inside of a green car, in which had air conditioning. And that was the first time that I ever felt what air conditioning felt like. And I was taken to a facility in Harlingen, Texas, where I was fed, where I was giving clothing, where I was food, where I was a number. I used to be number seven. And I started living, living in a facility where, where, people, where people treated me differently, where people like, like, they seemed like they cared about me. They, they wanted to feed me. They wanted to protect me. They wanted to reunify me with my mother. But at the same time, I had a very difficult time understanding me because of my lack or my inability to communicate because of the trauma, because of the experiences, because of everything that I had gone through the entire journey. After living about two months in the center, in the facility, I remember one day an immigration officer coming again and saying, I was having breakfast. And the officer came and said, number seven, let's go. And number seven, he went to go get his items, a little bit of clothing, whatever it is that I had. And then all of a sudden, I went outside. And I did not know what would happen to me because I didn't know if I would be deported or if I would be reunified because they wouldn't tell you because if they told you inside, either children would be upset because their case was not moving forward or you would actually go through a lot of trauma if you would actually be about to be deported. So all of a sudden I go outside, the immigration officer drives about 15 miles, 15 minutes into another location in Los Fresnos, Texas. When we get to Los Fresnos, Texas, the immigration officer opens the car of the patrol. He opens the door of another facility and he tells me to walk in. As I'm about to walk in, I see very clearly as if it was yesterday. There were like chairs on the side. There were like people on the side. And whenever I walked in, I remember having some pieces of paper within my hands. But as soon as I walked in, I looked into the horizon and into the very back, there was this very beautiful lady. Very beautiful lady with the very beautiful red lipstick. And as soon as I saw her, I did not care about anything. I ran towards her. I hugged her. I screamed. I started like having these energetic feelings throughout my body. And I was with my mother. Like I was reunified. I was giving an opportunity to be able to be with my mother, to be able to be with the person that has sacrificed so much for me. And I was allowed to stay in the United States due to fear of persecution with my own nation. And then we took a Greyhound bus to Houston, Texas, which would become my home. And I remember showing up to Houston at around 2.30 in the morning. And all of a sudden, like, imagine that kid that grew up in the trash field, that kid that walked through deserts and rode a train and had been detained and had no idea of what a big city like Houston looked like. And I get to Houston and all of a sudden I see those towers. Oh my goodness, so beautiful. The lights and colors. And I see bridges and a bridge here and a bridge there. I kid you not, I thought I was going to see Godzilla pop out one of those towers. Like I thought I was gonna see like Mickey Mouse or like an extraterrestrial activity. Like I was like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. We get out of the Greyhound bus and then all of a sudden we're in downtown. And my mom like stops a taxi and starts talking to the taxi driver in English. And I'm just like, wow, like no entendia nada. I had no understanding. What an incredible culture shock to begin a new life in downtown Houston. And to then go to what would be my first home, which would be a one bedroom apartment that we share with four other families. Because my mother had to get out of the shelter that it was all for women. And then she lived in a one bedroom apartment that she could afford because it's undocumented. Sometimes you get paid and sometimes you don't. As undocumented, you go through a lot of discrimination, a lot of stereotypes that often turns in the inability to create income, which limits their social and cultural mobility. And that's something that we must also understand that there are systems in place created to be able to limit our communities from succeeding. 
But what an education does is that it's the great equalizer that has the opportunity to level the playing field for the future generations. So as I think about my story, I'm not here to talk about a sad story because I'm here to talk about how throughout those journeys, throughout those paths, all of a sudden, I'm in, in, in the United States and I was here on a Monday and on a Tuesday, on a Tuesday, my mother took me to a hospital to go get like 20 or 30 shots. I remember like getting vaccinations and here and there. I remember walking out of the hospital like I was like, like a mommy like, oh my goodness, like I was all bended up. And all of a sudden, like I make it to a school, to a United States school. And I see locker rooms and I see teachers and I see lights and I see water fountains and soccer fields. And oh my goodness, are you kidding me? I fell in love with school. I fell in love with education. I was so grateful to be in a safe space. I was grateful to not have to dig for trash for food. I was grateful. I was grateful that I had a place to, to play soccer without being shot at. I was grateful that I could that I could learn how to use a keyboard. I was grateful that I had a teacher. I was I was so grateful. I just didn't know how to communicate it because of my trauma, because of the pains, because of my lack of English language acquisition, because of my inability to understand the contextual understanding of the United States. I didn't get it then. But now I do. So it's an honor, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be able to amplify the experiences of, undoc of undocumented students, of unaccompanied minors, of dreamers. It's a very beautiful honor to be with you, beautiful community, to be able for us to join forces to understand their experiences of these children, of our children, of your colleagues. I'm your colleague, I'm an unaccompanied minor. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for doing this work. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for your leadership on these issues because we have an opportunity to be able to transform a kid's life. I remember showing up to school and you know who I met? I met Mrs. Wright. I met my seventh grade teacher and Mrs. Wright told me that my past did not define my future. Mrs. Wright told me that regardless of my background, that regardless if I did not know this or that, that I was going to change. She told me that an education could transform my life. Like she told me that an education could make my family proud. She smiled whenever I walked into her classroom. She came on Saturdays after school to be able to teach me how to utilize a keyboard because I had no idea what a computer was. She was there for me. She spoke my language. She understood me. She cared about me. She understood that my own language was my ability to be able to develop my second language. Mrs. Wright changed me by allowing me to be me and by allowing my experiences to be able to honor her classroom. Mrs. Wright taught me beyond content and she went into values and into visions and into creating in me a seed that, that has turned into who I am today. I know teachers make a difference and you make a difference. So you know what that did? Throughout time, I became the first one in my entire generations of heritage to have graduated from high school. And by being undocumented because I lost my case to political due to the lack of evidence. I had no evidence to have proven what happened to me in Honduras because I didn't create an archive of documents that I brought with me as I was traveling through rivers, deserts, or trains. It was very difficult for a child to be able to face the most powerful immigration system of the world and to be able to win. So it was difficult, especially whenever you don't have the resources to hire an attorney, it's very difficult. So how powerful that this is an opportunity for you to look at this issue and be able to help students by donating to kind kids in the need of defense to be able to look into their needs and just not only have a conversation, but to be able to be able to contribute to the cause. This is an opportunity. This is an opportunity. This is a movement. So please, please, please take action. Take action. I know very soon here, Silence Education will be sharing the link where you can donate where you can help out children that are on the border, that are migrating. I have been in a lot of places, a lot of places, and I am seeing kind inside those places, helping children. So I know that the groundwork is legit and real. So please support kind because they have the ability to be able to help a child not go through a system alone and to be able to help them and provide defense and protection. So please, please, please support. And let's not just only reach that 
maximum, but let's keep on going. And let's make sure that people know what's happening, not only here within this Zoom, but like take it to social media. Let your colleagues know that you care about this issue. Go into, into your networks, right? Let people know, share this event, do something beyond just learning the information that can transform the lives of these children and how this information can serve as a catalyst for other professionals across the nation to also do the work that you're doing. And then I, graduated from high school and I went into a community college because my advisor told me that in the state of Texas, despite of being undocumented, that there was a law that would allow undocumented students the ability to matriculate at institutions of higher education while also paying in-state tuition. So I didn't know what all that meant. All I knew was that I needed to go to college because she was telling me, because my soccer coach was telling me that I needed to go to, go to college and I went to Lone Star Community College in Houston, Texas, where I graduated with an associate's degree. I remember showing up to my, my English language development classes and, and, and having my weed eater in my lawnmower and my blower in the back of my truck because I was still a business owner. The same way that I used to shine shoes in Honduras, I, had, I, I was told that as an undocumented immigrant, I couldn't work. But I was never told that I couldn't create my own business. So I created a lawnmower business. And through that, I was able to buy my books. I would go to flea markets. I would, I would crochet. I would do a lot of interesting things. I would work in construction, in restaurants to be able to provide for my family, to be able to help for the bills, to be able to also create a path for my sister who was also following my journey. And then I transferred to Texas A&M University, the home of the Aggies, where I graduated with my bachelor's degree in math and science in interdisciplinary studies to teach middle grade students. But my immigration status limited my ability to be able to teach. I couldn't teach. I couldn't teach because I wasn't documented. So what did I do? I pursued a master's in English as a second language to be able to honor Mrs. Wright, to be able to also carry a message of hope through the power of education. I finished my master's and I still can teach. So then I get recruited by the Department of Education into a PhD in urban education. And after 13 and a half years, 13 and a half years of just institutions of higher education. I completed a PhD. But what's most important is that I did not finish the loan, is that whenever I graduated, I graduated with the sacrifices of my parents, that the day that I graduated college, so did my mom, so did my, my stepfather. My mother would clean homes. My mother would babysit. My mother maybe was not at every single parent meeting, but you know what? I had food at the table, and it was that food that fed me to be able to be in school the next day. Every time that I came home, maybe she was not able to help me with my homework, but she wanted me to be a good person, a person person of respect, a person of kindness, a person that was a good person. And that instilled in me values to be able to honor her through education. And education was not just an opportunity to be able to succeed personally or academically. It allowed me to be able to empower and honor the sacrifices of my family. And today, today what's most important about my life is not the fact that, that I have a PhD and that I want to make a difference. But it's the fact that, that I today I'm also, that I'm also a father. The fact that, the fact that the same kid that grew up in a trash field, Look, how would you come? Wow, look, hi, say hi. Hi, baby. As I think about the impact that an education has done in my life, it has not only inspired me, but it has created a generational impact to the point that she, she will never experience what her father experienced. She would never experience the pain of a country or the pain of an entire nation because an education has given me the ability to be able to level the playing field and to be able to create a generational legacy for my future families. So as you continue to do this work, just please know that I thank you, that I honor you, and I applaud you for the beautiful and powerful work that you are doing to serve on a company minors, migrant children, refugee children, 
children that are English learners. And please, as a community, continue, continue the beautiful work of rapid language acquisition, the steps that you utilize to be able to teach literacy, because the most powerful tool that children can have is the ability to communicate. So thank you for your work. Thank you for the ability to be here, to be able to talk about a generational impact and how if a child who grew up in a trash field, like myself, has the ability to be able to create a generational impact, so does every single child as yourself that is in your classroom, that, it's, that is with you, that gives you the ability to be able to be able to to be able to create also a generational impact in their lives. To conclude, let me show you something. Let me show you the, the sweater. As I have the opportunity of being with children, I'm not the only one. Unaccompanied minors across the nation, their voices are amplified. Their experiences must be heard and their names should go beyond numbers. I used to be number seven, but now, but now I'm Dr. Zelaya. And I seek to be able to also share how generational power can create a difference in the lives of children. Thank you so much, Sightless Education, for doing this work. And thank you so much, beautiful community, for this humble opportunity of sharing my story. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Luis. And I, uh, wow, it's kind of hard to talk after that. I think we were all really touched. And thank you also, uh, uh, all those who helped to put this together and uh, in layer education who's co-sponsoring the conference with us. Um, well, I don't have any real words right now. So I think we're just gonna go ahead and uh, and, and take a, uh, just thank you. And that's what everybody's saying in the chat right now. Just, just thank you for sharing this. Uh, I needed to hear it. I think we all needed to hear this. I, I, somebody said in the chat, Dr. Izquierdo said, every teacher in Texas, no, every teacher in the country <laughs> needs to hear what you shared. Um, Anna, do we have anything else before we go to the next one? I'll, I'll paste the link one more time into the chat. Uh, we are almost there, guys. We're at, at 4,100 some odd dollars. So if you could, uh, 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 we, we could just bump that over, that would be really awesome. Yeah, it's uh, unbelievable. Thank you so much, Jose Luis, for that. That was so amazing and beautiful. We're so touched. Your daughter's beautiful. Your daughter's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, we just like a thousand dollars in the last hour. That's amazing. It's so, so amazing. So we are going to start with Ari Honarvar at about 10 minutes. So 12.15 is her start time. So we'll try and give about a 10 minute break if we can, but come on back by 12.15 and I will set the link to go again so you can see the slides and donate if you have the ability to. We appreciate it. Any dollar counts. And we'll see you guys in about um, eight to 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you.
All right, everyone, it is 1215 Central Time. Hopefully you had a nice little break and you had a chance to donate if you are able to. And we're going to, go ahead. I just want to tell you, uh, Anna and John and everyone, we officially passed the 5,000 mark. So thank you to everyone who is donating and please continue, continue to do so. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Um, we'll be joined, I think, by, by um, and momentarily by Ari Hunarvar. So in the meantime, John, do you have any words for us? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I, the fact that we got, I know that, uh, oh, Michelle, uh, Dr. Izquierdo just said, can you paste the link again? I know that when we set the $5,000 mark for the ambition, for the, for kind, that there was people that said it was too much. And I think maybe it was, I thought at first, but the fact that we met it is just amazing. Uh, and I'm so excited to, to see Ari. I love her, her books, the, the, the Rumi cards. I have a copy. I think, anyway, I, I won't talk about Ari. I'll let, I'll let Orly introduce Ari, but the work she does is just amazing. And, and I'll let Orly go ahead and officially introduce our next speaker. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, our next speaker is Ari Honarvar, who grew up in Shiraz, Iran, where she was surrounded by Persian poetry and art. Growing up during the Iran Iraq War, she came to the US at the age of 14. She has taken her love of poetry and music to work with refugee families and unaccompanied minors, founding Rumi with a view to bridge art and healing. Ari is a journalist, author, and Iranian musical ambassador of peace. Her forthcoming novel, A Girl Called Rumi, weaves the tale of immigration, redemption, and the power of storytelling. Welcome, Ari. We're excited to hear from you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, organizers, donors the wonderful and so powerful speakers who presented before me. And of course, the audience, um, you are here because you care for vulnerable populations and want to be there for refugees and asylum kids. So my story, as John mentioned, um, began in Shiraz, Iran, the city of poets and wine. So I grew up in a culture in which poetry was part of our heartbeat. We didn't just recite poems at weddings and funerals, but we recited them in a response to a question to welcome sorrow, joy, and even when we were resolving conflicts. <clears throat> My early childhood memories <clears throat> from what I recall are pretty normal. We had uh, played with other kids. Uh, there was a lot of poetry, of course, picnics, family gatherings, danced and sang and played. Uh, but my worldview and my world changed when I was six. Women of Iran, as a result of the, the Islamic Republic revolution that ousted the Shah, lost their right to sing or ride a bicycle in public. They, um, women judges were stripped of their position. Uh, we literally had to sit on the back of the bus. Um, woman's life was worth as much as a man's life, literally, because of the Islamic, the strict interpretation of the Sharia law that the uh, government decided was the law of the land at the moment. And oh, of course, dissidents were uh, disappeared. There was crackdowns, there were executions. As uh, women didn't just you know, sit down and say, okay, we're gonna take this, they protested. Women, men who defended women, men who didn't think that this was right, that freedom of speech was curtailed, so civil liberties were taken away, they were, met with brute force as well. So um, from, from uh, everything just changed. And then a year into this, Saddam Hussein attacked Iran and started a war that lasted eight years and took countless lives, uh, more than a million. And I say that because we're not just talking about those who died, which you know estimated about a million on both sides, 
But when a war like this happens, there are refugees created, there are amputees who are created, there are orphans who are created, there are people who lost their homes. So, so you just, there was multi-generational trauma. So at this point, there was a war of two nations. There was a domestic war of terror. And there was a war on joy, which hurts in a different way. So there was a war on our coping mechanisms, music, dancing, freedom of speech, the ability to complain, playing cards, bagamon, boys playing with girls, unrelated men and women being in the same room with that hijab, all that became illegal. And when the society is under such tremendous amount of pressure from all these different sides, it really starts cracking. And we, we, we're seeing a little bit of that glimpse of that. We've been seeing that for the past several years here because people are under such tremendous pressure, uh, not just in their own lives, but what is happening around us with the pandemic, with political situations and such. So um, the stress makes domestic violence worse. It exacerbates illness. When you're constantly in a state of hypervigilance, your body responds by breaking down because it doesn't get the luxury of rest and repair. So people had to become resourceful to survive. Alcohol was, of course, illegal, you know, so um, that was taken out of the city of poets and wine. So, but our poetry, it was, it, it survived. And I usually tell this story of moments of, um, of, of transcendence about when I was uh, seven years old and when we were really brave we would go to our rooftops to watch the anti-aircraft missiles shoot up into the air and the patterns that you would see in the black skies were as glorious as fourth of july fireworks but underneath that awe to my seven-year-old eyes you know it was so beautiful underneath that awe there was such a terror who was the lottery of death going to get next? Was it going to be me, my sister in Tehran, my best friend, my teacher? And then from another rooftop, someone would shout something like, Barhamagan garz falak zah bebograt hamishab man shekharandar, 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 shekharandar. Even if from the sky poison befalls all, I am still sweetness, wrapped in sweetness, wrapped in sweetness, wrapped in sweetness. And a passerby below would respond to that with another verse. While others are singing about love, I am the Sultan of love. And verses like that go right into your seven year old heart and you radiate to every cell of your being until your world is as glorious as a 13th century mystic, until you're everything and nothing at the same time. And what bomb could ever touch that? So I'm sharing that with you because moments like that really helped 
when I was developing my workshops and programs, I drew on those moments. I drew on the moments that I coped with the stress of being an unaccompanied kid without my parents. I drew on, when I wrote my novel, I was tapping into how we can change perception of reality through our senses and imagination. The way that my world in the grimmest of circumstances was changed in that moment and how beautiful that was. Of course, this was an all um, poetry and, uh, and, and uh, being ecstatic. Life was really difficult. I was enraged as a teen. I was a fierce feminist and wanted to express myself. I didn't think it was fair that kids, um, you know, my age who were boys were able to run and play and do whatever, where, what, uh, whatever they wanted when I couldn't. I didn't think it was fair that I couldn't express my dissent, my frustration. So I went and started writing anti regime and anti Khomeini rhetorics on the walls. This is something that could have landed me in jail or worse. So, so many people by this point are arrested, executed. There were public executions. So you could go out onto the street and see a body hanging from a scaffold. And my sister's classmates, there were, she was a senior in high school. There were 16 of, she was 16, 17, you know, 18, that, that age range. And uh, half of her classmates were imprisoned. Imagine that, teenagers going to jail. And one of them was executed. They just told her parents to come get her body. There was no public trial. There was no reason for her arrest. So this is the kind of terror that we had to deal with. Of course, my parents, you know, were worried about me because I was doing similar things. And when you express your dissent against the law of the nation, it's just not the law, but the Islamic law. It's your, you're going, your word against God. And the punishment for that is really severe. It could be anything. So it was a poem that saved my life. My mother wrote a poem to the Indian embassy for India's Independence Day, along with our visa application. This is a time when people are desperate to get out of the country, those who have the means to get out of the country and there is no, nobody's giving them visas. So we, um, you know, people took drastic outrageous measures they uh, married their daughters to someone older who could get them out of the country for their safety. Or there would be, um, someone would be like, wow, um, let's you know, pay a smuggler a really hefty sum. And they would take them to the Iran-Turkey border and they would say, hey, now go ahead and run in a zigzag pattern as you cross the border. In case they shot at you, you'll have a less of a chance to get shot. So it was this poem, the Indian ambassador miraculously must have liked that poem because he granted us a visa to India. And in India, because there is no diplomatic relation between the US and uh, Iran, I was able to, in India, uh, secure an appointment with an American, with the American embassy. And we got the visa to come, but my parents had to come here and then leave me and go back because that's the situation. You know, we all couldn't stay, only one of us could stay. I was 14, I, this was a different planet. It was so strange, I didn't speak any English. And uh, I had all the trauma of war and everything. So it was music and dancing, something that was uh, denied to me as a child. That's what I used to really help um, get my, um, get, get through depression, homesickness and survive. And I use some of those coping mechanisms in what I do with the asylum seekers and refugees right now. 
So this was kind of uh, my situation. It was so difficult to be in a um, in 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 a in a world. And an American family took took me for um, welcomed me, and I was living with them for a while. And they were so sweet, but it was really difficult. And then I lived with my brother, who I hadn't seen for 10 years because he left before the revolution uh, as an extreme student and then came and then, I, and then he couldn't come back and I couldn't see him. So it was an anthropological experiment. And that's for another um, you know, topic for another session. But what I want to say is the what we can do as educators and as um, people who care about refugees and asylum seekers, there are ways that we can um, help in a really, really simple way, ways that we have evolved to, to do. So I'm going to share my screen. And I apologize, this is the first time I've actually done my own um, my own slideshow. So usually someone else does my slideshow. So I have to see. Um, Okay, that button is not showing up for. Can you tell me where the, it usually comes in the bottom for the share that, oh, there's, okay, got it. So, um, thank you. Okay, can everyone see this? Okay. Um, there, my apologies. So this is ways to welcome and uh, include refugee and asylum kids. And uh, what I want to talk about is what's good for us, what's good for them is good for all of us. And so I'm just gonna take a moment, I've been talking for a while and welcome us, because to welcome children, let's welcome ourselves to this moment. And, um, this is a scene from uh, one of my dance and, um, and um, music sessions that I run in Tijuana. And, in, um, and I have done that with uh, refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, Iran, um, Iraq, and other nations, Haiti, uh, Venezuela, and Central America. So, so this is all a customized, uh, situation where we, through musical ambassadors of peace, I developed this program to, um, to, to honor the indigenous cultures that uh, the refugees are coming from and incorporate some of the techniques that I learned in my own uh, path to, to uh, integration to, to share with them. So um, just take a moment and arrive in your seat with your body right here and um, as you're um, sitting here, take a few nice deep breaths and notice where you are in this moment. Are you hungry? Are you happy, sad, is there pain? And just notice that for a moment.
And then these are some of the things we do in our beginning ceremonies with, with the asylum seekers and refugees that really have shown to, to uh, resonate with them. So we drop our hand and then and we kind of just do this. Then we do a little bit of tapping. And in our full program, we do the tapping all over the body. And just notice how in this few seconds, how are things a little bit different? For me, I'm feeling more quiet. Okay? And there's a little bit of a tingling for a half tap. It feels good. So just notice what's happening in your own kind of uh, body as you're doing this. The other thing that we do is give a little, this is the Enrique Morones, my uh, colleague and the founder of Gente Unida and Border Angels. He um, does this when I give him an essential oil and just a little bit of a massage, you know. So imagine doing this six or seven periods if you're an educator or six or, you know, throughout the day, seven or eight micro breaks, micro spa moment that you have. How does that change you? So this, my whole approach is that increasing the capacity for joy also increases the capacity for suffering. And to deal with so much of our own lives, because our lives have trauma in them as well. You know, people are in a pandemic, we're losing loved ones, we've got um, financial situations that, that um, take our time, we have relational issues, and then we got the vicarious trauma. So I started the um, drum and dance sessions with refugees as part of Musical Ambassadors of Peace in um, El Cajon, California. And uh, we did this, you know, we played the Iraqi love songs and the Syrian love songs, and we just danced and we drummed our feelings. And then when, um, when, when the Muslim ban happened, uh, people couldn't come here anymore as new refugees, as new newcomers. So uh, I ended up having to, um, go to, um, I, was, I was on the border doing journalism work. I was there so, uh, interviewing separated kids uh, or, or kids who, um, families who had been through so much trauma, you know, um, those who had been in a situation of, um, in the detention center and uh, the abuse that they had received. This uh, one article I wrote was about a six-year-old girl who, from Guatemala who was separated from her parents, her, from her mother at the border and was taken to an Arizona facility detention center where she was sexually abused. And she had to sign a paper that said that it was her responsibility to stay away from her abuser. So that was so traumatic for, for her, of course. She couldn't recognize her mother after months of separation. She um, thought she was another social worker. She had to sleep with the lights on. But the trauma is severe. And those who report on trauma, those who report, who, who are around it a lot, like educators or um, people who care, they, you know, to, we don't want to, take on the vicarious trauma ourselves because we want to keep our mental health hygiene up to um, up to the moment. So so just as we take a shower, we want to just keep cleansing ourselves of uh, the uh, the what's happening so we can have more of a capacity to 
to care for others. So what's good for them is good for us. Just doing these little teeny um, exercises, honoring and utilizing the body. This is one of the things we do. I worked at the convention center when all the unaccompanied minors from the uh, from uh, Central America was com were coming here. First of all, we went over there and we shouted at the buses saying, we love you, welcome, thank you, you know, we're here for you. And then uh, when I went over there, some girls really wanted to, to dance and sing and, and, and uh, you know, increase their capacity for joy uh, through, through that. And others were really shy. So I would always bring a ball and we would just play and we're like, oh no, don't stress. And we just in a circle and we hit the ball to each other. And when it falls to the ground, we all clap and cheer because it's a way of celebrating um, our failures and <laughs> and just just having a good time, you know. Uh, my childhood, just like many people's childhood, I, I was robbed of it because of what was what had happened. But as adults, we always have the opportunity to be playful, and playfulness is such a beautiful way to deal. Is playfulness is another way of changing your perspective and your perception and dealing with the cards that are that you're dealt with. These, you know, we were in the middle of measles, lice, you know, uh, fires in Tijuana, and and we're having a good time. We're we're dancing, we're celebrating, and um, this is kind of uh, what what I did to be able to to deal with all the horror stories that I came across. They, most of the people who came from Central America, they had such similar stories to uh, what I had heard from say ISIS, former ISIS sex, sex slaves who were in Kurdistan or Syria or um, the, the brutality of war. So the violent, the level of violence that so many people had experienced was, was tremendous. So, so there's a way that we can um, do things that are healthy and good for us and do it for our children. You know, if um, your kids have a uh, favorite song that in another language or in uh, English, if you play that right before the school begins or your classroom begins, that just really brightens their heart because uh, music has just such a way of going right into your um, your heart, and and uh, you know you it it gives you so much ability to be resilient and and uh, and connect with really good memories. So um, this is from uh, what what are the things that I've found so effective is opening and closing rituals. And I know that so many of you have um, in issues with, um, you know, there, there's instructional minutes and you got a limited amount of time. So these are take two or three minutes max to, to, do, to do these things. And these are a group of doctors from UCLA a few weeks ago came to drop water for migrants who crossed the desert. There's about 50 of them. They came here because uh, they wanted to feel what it's like to be hiking through a desert in 120 degree heat and how horrible it is and also save lives by leaving waters out. So one way that I prepared, that I hope that I prepared them for, for this uh, trek through the desert was to create a sense of cohesion. So this opening ritual, it is so easy. These um, doctors, you know, we had never met. And I just started clapping and they just started following. I didn't have to give them any instructions. So, so this is kind of how, how it went. Okay, so basically that is 
um, you know, something that is so easy. I'm just like, focus, focus, focus. And I know so many of you use uh, this kind of, uh, um, you know, clapping as, as a way of, um, of, of uh, you know, getting your students' attention. But this is like a 30 second thing in the beginning of class that you could do. Um, or in the beginning, like of any project, if you do this a few minutes for not even that for 30 seconds, that's just such a beautiful way of, of uh, getting the resonance. And we're, we're, when we're doing this, our rest and digest system kicks in because we're resonating, we're co-regulating with so many other people who are also getting relaxed, getting into a sense of cohesion. We're primates, we're social animals, and this is what we've evolved to do. It's so easy to do this. Remember that what is enjoyable and what is easy is sustainable. So I always find what is everyone just immediately gets into, and we can just build a habit of doing this. I do this, some things, one of these things several times a day, and that's how I'm able to, to, uh, to stay open and be able to hear and be there and uh, really hold uh, other people's sufferings. And I think it, it, uh, it works pretty well for everyone. The other thing that we do that is just so uh, enjoyable and every refugee uh, gets into is using of essential oils, the sense of smell. And you see one kid here who's really getting, and this is like old ladies from the back come in and they're like, oh, wow, you know, like, Give us the, <laughs> give us the goods. So, um, and we just put a little drop on and, you know, even if you don't have essential oils, if you can't use it in your, just imagining a taste, a smell um, is, is also effective. One of the exercises that I tell people is like, imagine getting a cardboard, getting a cutting board out, getting a, lime out and cutting it and then uh, take that half of a lime smell it and then um, squeeze it on your tongue and if you're feeling that lime you're salivating a little bit it's because the power of imagination we can use the five senses even if we're not really um, we don't have access to to certain smells or food etc so um, one other way is to get your kids to orient um, to one scent at the, for five days. So the first uh, days, like just look around, take, look around the room and find an object that you find pleasing to the eye. And just think about the texture and the color and the brightness and what memory it invokes. You can the same do the same thing with all the other senses for touch, you know, just the fabric of your clothes, you know, just notice how soft or how rough the texture, just notice that. So noticing that, orienting in that, it takes only a couple of, um, a few seconds, not too long. And we have evolved to co-regulate together, to sing and dance together. So we are animal, we are animals. Our brain evolved for movement. So now we are in a situation that because of technology and because of restrictions, we're always sitting down and looking at our screen. There are a way that we need to really utilize our bodies throughout the day, take a lot of breaks, allow your students to take a lot of little 10 seconds, five second breaks from, from, from everything. And this is a little bit of a... Um, Uno, dos, tres. What they're saying is somos una familia sin fronteras. And that's one of our closing rituals that we close, we gather in a circle and we come in holding hands saying, we are one family without borders. And we do that three times and it's really sweet. And this is a little video of the sessions from 
our um, our dance dance here on up. So I hold the kids so their parents can dance untethered. And children really look at the adults to see what's up. They really pick up on the energy. If the adults are relaxed, if they feel present, if they're having a good time, then the kids follow suit and they really enjoy themselves and, and start dancing together and, and, uh, and say, oh, this is a moment of belonging. This is a moment of safety. And we do say to them, this is how part of the education, what, what, are, what is happening right now? Are we, uh, we are increasing our immune system, we're boosting our immune system, we're increasing our mental health. Uh, when we build our capacity for joy, which we're doing right now, we are increasing our capacity for the challenges ahead. So remember these moments, we're creating memories. These are memories we're creating that are good and wholesome and we're together and we have a sense of belonging. And when we do that, then um, everything changes. Our whole life, our whole perception, everything becomes better. Peter is a little bit frozen. Okay. So then we have another video I'm going to share with you. Okay, now I think it's back. Maybe it's not happening. My apologies. But um, yeah, so the uh, sense of belonging, the sense of togetherness is something that we can really do as, 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 as a group. Um, and that's something that's really lacking. Um, so that's what I'm hoping that we can um, keep tapping into, keep looking for ways to increase your capacity for to enjoy the pleasant, uh, the present moment, something that's pleasant. If you're drinking your tea, really savor the flavor. If you're looking at something beautiful, just really put all your attention to it. It only takes a few seconds to do that. And once we change our own makeup, we get into the rest and digest, then other people feel more comfortable around us. If the kids are doing this six or seven times a day of drumming, mental health, you know, dancing, um, anything that has a sense of cohesion, an opening ritual and a closing ritual, all of that becomes a way of um, that, that they take that home. They can share it with others. Their presence, you know, their capacity for, for joy is increased so they can deal with challenges a little bit better. It's part of the mental health hygiene and what, what another thing that happens is like the co cohesion of the group. Um, you see soldiers march. There is no tactical reason for soldiers to do that. That does not make them better fighters or better, um, you know, better soldiers as far as defending or, or attacking. But it does create a sense of 
co-regulation and cohesion because we're doing things at the same time. So drumming, dancing, we're using our mirror neurons to um, learn from each other and mimic each other as social animals. And that really helps, helps us, helps the society. So if I'm uh, done, if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Ari. That was so beautiful. Thank you for sharing what you do with your students and, and in your work. It was really wonderful to see. And I think it impacted a lot of our teachers and educators. There were so many of us who were sharing stuff that we do with kids or have done with kids in the past. I used to start my class, both my ESL and my history classes with, everybody would stand up and recite something. Sometimes it'd be the preamble to the Declaration, the Constitution, or a little quote from Walt Whitman or something, but it was just something we did every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know a lot of educators, I don't know if you're older like me, you may have heard of Harry Wong, but he used to talk about the importance of opening and closing rituals mm -hmm. in teaching. And hearing Emily and Jorge and uh, Jose Luis talk about their trauma and yours, it's one of those things that it's not on our radar screen always to create joy and how healing joy and music and dance and uh and rhythm can be i think we, we we've all been uh really touched by your work and, and what you're sharing and i'm anxious to see uh the book uh, uh a girl called rumi which is it september is that right ari it's coming out in september it is i have an advanced copy which i'm super excited about oh. <laughs> and uh and that's uh it's coming out in september and that basically is the eyes of a nine-year-old girl looking at the world and also tapping into that beautiful sense of storytelling that that uh, Jose and Emily and uh, and all of you, you know, teachers are storytellers and people who are you know, we, again that we've evolved with storytelling. That's something that's so innate in us. And this, what you were saying about the closing and opening rituals being so important it is because our lives are so the kids lives are so precarious you know a lot of times and but that they can count on that this is happening at this, this time even things that we do like reading the objectives and those kinds of things that we do every day it becomes an anchor like this is i know this is going to happen well something i didn't know what was going to happen was that we would exceed the level that we had hoped to raise with this fundraiser. We have, instead of just getting 5,000, we've actually raised $5,776, which uh, uh, Silence Education is gonna match those dollars. So thank you so much for your donations, everybody. I wanna thank specifically uh, Gabriel Seidlitz, Michelle Izquierdo, Alma Seidlitz, Janelle Henderson, uh, Marie Heath, Claudia Lagos, so many familiar names here. Uh, Marlo Ajancara, Liz S, Margaret Ballantine, uh, Norma Villavicencio, Carlos, Carly Spina, uh, Alex Pinella, Tammy Baggett, Nini Zava uh, Zavaleta, Cami Williams, Rhonda Hintenberger, Denise Kemper, Norma Lucio Vasquez, Marie Almendarez, uh, Pam Broussard, Tammy Gringas, Audra Ollinger, Edyata uh, Medina, Kimberly Mitchell, Melanie Lassester, Stephanie, wow, so many. <laughs> Susanna McNamara, Julie Olsh, Don Navejas, and Victoria Hang, and I think, Victoria Hung, and I think we've, that's, that's everybody that we mentioned that, we, that we've included everyone. So we are about, I think, uh, one minute uh, from closing, but uh, this has been an amazing experience. I wanna thank all of the organizers, especially the behind the scenes and in the scenes people, Meg and Anna, you two are, uh, organizational geniuses <laughs> and I thank you for all of your work and putting this together with our speakers thank you uh, especially I want to thank uh, Jorge our young the young high school student who shared as well as uh, Jose Luis and Emily and Ari for sharing from the heart and not just the head uh, and none of us would be here uh, I, I, we, we've had a range of almost 200 people here today at various times throughout the day. And it's available free online. Anybody can watch it. Please share in your social networks. Um, it'll be uh, on our line. There's a link to the certificate. Uh, Anna, can you tell them uh, we're right at one o'clock, but do you want to share with them just how they can access this online? 
Um, sure. So like you mentioned with the certificate, we just dropped the link for that into the chat. So if you need proof of that, we have that there. Um, this will become the recording in the next 24 hours will become uh, sent out to those people that registered as well as housed on our Sideless Education YouTube site. So you can always come back to our website, sidelesseducation.com, and you'll be able to, in the, in the coming days, get not only this entire conference link, but the individual slides that our speakers are wanting to share. You'll be able to get links for that as well. So Everything that you need is there. And just a quick update, it's actually 5,803 now. Woohoo! <laughs> pushing refresh. So um, you can absolutely share the link to once you receive it to anybody that you think would benefit from this. And again, uh, we want to thank all of our amazing speakers and presenters for being here with us today and all of you educators out in the field that are doing so much for our students. Um, we wouldn't be here without you, so thank you. All right, uh, appreciate all of the kind comments that uh, you're sharing uh, with us and with our speakers in the chat as well. So uh, I think we're ready to say goodbye. I don't feel like it. I feel so good in <laughs> this has been such a great day. It's been so powerful. I really, I don't want it to end, but all good things must come to an end. Thanks again, everybody. And we will see you later. Thank you.